Okay, so I think we'll start. Um, so hi everybody. Uh, so my name is uh, Tim Burns. I'm your lecturer for this course, Introduction to Quantum Information. Um, so what I'll do just today is firstly just to um, take you through what this course will entail. Um, uh, I'll just go through the syllabus first and then you can ask any questions about what um, the content of the course will be and the assessments and so forth. Um, and if we're all fine with that, then we can maybe proceed and have a small kind of warm-up lecture uh, that will just give you a kind of a breezy introduction to Um, you'll notice I've got all these cameras and stuff everywhere. I just record everything uh, these days, and um, it, I think uh, you'll find it that uh, I might have to ask you for your help in doing some of the uh, scene changes, but let me get to that later. Okay, so um, the syllabus, uh, I just made the Brightspace page just, just now, so you probably haven't seen it yet. There's not much content there exactly, but um, I will uh, upload more and more things onto the Brightspace page, but uh, right now there's just a syllabus that's, uh, on Brightspace, so I'll just uh, walk you through that. Um, so this course uh, is two lectures a week, um, both at this time on Tuesday and Thursday in this, in this room. Um, there are no recitations. I think uh, if you have any questions about any problems, we can just sort that out during the lecture. So I think there's no need for recitation. Um, my office hours are 4.30 to 5.30 every day, and um, uh, it's in room 1200. That's actually not my office. That's actually just a room where, um, so I have a research group, and we do research into quantum computing. And that's basically where my research group meets. So if you ever pop in there, what you'll see is like a bunch of people with laptops just hanging around. Um, it looks like we're working, but um, uh, don't worry, just come in and then and, you know, I can hopefully help you out with any questions. So uh, just walk in any time, any weekday. So I'd say every day, obviously weekdays only. Um, my office is uh, 11.13, you can contact me my email, of course. As I said, the course website is, I just launched it on Brightspace just uh, uh, half an hour ago or so. And this is obviously where you'll have all the course information. Um, uh, I'll you know, do things like upload slides and any other things, um, assignment topics like that but I don't really use it so heavily it's just basically a common site that you can use to download things um, and maybe an important thing about this particular course is the prerequisites <coughs> so I've set the prerequisites uh, very very low for this course so um, uh, formally it's linear algebra or uh, differential equations. Um, in terms of the actual maths that we will be using, linear algebra is actually the closely, like most closely related topic. Um, nevertheless, I still put differential equations because essentially, you know, we will go through a little bit of mathematics in this course. It's actually kind of impossible not to. Um, you know, do quantum mechanics properly without involving any mathematics. But um, uh, the actual kind of mathematics is not so hard. Um, what we'll be doing is mainly dealing with things like matrices and vectors. So linear algebra is, of course, basically just like um, vectors and matrices, but also with complex numbers. So if you're familiar with complex numbers, if you're familiar with matrices, then you know, more or less that's the main type of mathematics that you really need. Um, and 
this course is actually pretty unique in the sense that <coughs> um, uh, quantum mechanics normally would be taught maybe in your uh, third year um, in a physics course. But, uh, and in fact, this kind of course, quantum information, normally it would be like a senior level course because obviously it uses quantum mechanics and then it's an application of quantum mechanics. But um, I've kind of restructured this course completely so that I'm assuming that you don't really have much or any knowledge of, of quantum mechanics actually at all. Um, and so basically I'm going to teach you quantum mechanics from zero. And so the first half of the course will be just kind of learning the basics of quantum mechanics. And then maybe the second half is kind of applying it. And um, uh, obviously this is not a sort of a substitute for really learning quantum mechanics properly, but interestingly, for doing things like quantum computing, um, you don't really need to know all the you know stuff that you get taught in a regular quantum mechanics course. So, um, <coughs> um, so this is why the prerequisites are very low. So it's basically for students who um, just want to you know maybe maybe your major is not physics and maybe just have an interest in quantum computing. Um, and so this type of course actually is kind of designed spe specially for uh, a lot of the students who might be here at NYU Shanghai because um, there's not so many physics majors, but there's quite a lot of people doing other courses like uh, maths and computer science. Okay, so that's the prerequisites. The textbook, um, this is the, well, this is the textbook that um, I recommend in this course, but it's not really the textbook that I really follow because actually I don't think there really is a very good textbook that teaches this course in the way that I'm teaching, I'm going to teach it. So uh, this goes into like way more detail than we will do in the course. But of course, it's a it's a great reference book. In fact, I you know I love this textbook actually. It's a it's a really nicely written textbook. It's uh, for a physics textbook. It's actually really fun to read. Um, the language that they use very casual, and it kind of just introduces things in a real no nonsense way. So I really really recommend this book. But um, it's not really a required textbook. You don't have to buy this textbook for this course. Um, uh, you know, it's just a good textbook maybe to have, to refer to. So really the lecture notes and the lectures will be the main thing that uh, you basically get your um, information from. Okay, so, oh yeah, okay, and then there's another textbook uh, David Griffiths, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. So that's obviously more of a textbook that's uh, geared towards learning quantum mechanics and doesn't have anything like quantum computing, quantum information at all. Um, so, uh, you know, that's if you want to get deeper into quantum mechanics. But the, uh, maybe this one that I have the picture of here is the, is the main textbook. Um, yeah, so the Basically, the goal of this course is for you to be able to kind of understand the basics of quantum computing, especially. Um, so, actually, I wanted to change the name of this course to actually more like Introduction to Quantum Computing, uh, but I didn't get around to it. But So, actually, maybe a, a better description of this course is, in fact, Introduction to Quantum Computing, because uh, the kind of things that will do things like you know qubits and quantum computers and quantum algorithms. Uh, quantum information is a slightly more broader topic that covers other types of topics which we don't really do so much. But the aim of this course is for you to sort of basically understand you know how our quantum computer works um, and you know not necessarily understand everything in the field, but uh, you know understand a lot more than your average person um, and be actually able to do 
calculations, uh, you know, simple calculations in this type of area. Yeah, so the, the topics are like this. Um, so firstly, uh, oh yeah, I about this. Okay, so, yes, so uh, I'll start off with a historical introduction of quantum theory. Um, and then there's a, a couple of uh, lectures where I'll just do some revision of kind of the, the basic mathematics that you need. Um, even if you haven't really seen it exactly like this before, it's not too hard to, I think, Get uh, to learn it, um, even if you haven't seen it before. Um, and then we'll start basically learning the basics of quantum mechanics, quantum wave function, Schrodinger's equation, uh, how measurements work, operators. And then the second half is sort of application. So this is the quantum computing part, qubits, teleportation, uh, Rover's algorithm. Might change this around a little bit as we go. Okay, and right grading. Um, um, so the grading will go something like this: is basically two exams, midterm and final. Uh, the homework questions each week. So you hand them in. Um, let's say. Tuesday lecture every week. And then there's also an assignment component uh, where I give out some kind of questions that you could sort of go into. Uh, just we'll, we'll talk about that later, but uh, some examples of assignment questions that people did last year were things like, um, so these days there are some quantum computers that you can access through the cloud like IBM has one that's maybe the best known one. And um, uh, what they did was basically to run this quantum computer through the cloud, you know, get some actual result, uh, data and you know, see if it matches with what they expect, things like that. So, you know, you, you have an opportunity to really run an actual quantum computer, which is a uh, at least the students last year, they, they found that that was pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, so, well, okay. I say it's given during the lecture, but basically there's, there's homework problem sets which I'll upload to Brightspace each, each week. So you just hand in the homework for that week. This, these assignments, as I said, are kind of rather open-ended topics. So there's not really like a, it's not like, you know, here's the right answer and you're just trying to, Get the right answer. It's sort of more like you, um, you know, investigate it and do something a little bit open-ended, a little bit more like a research topic. And so the assignment, uh, you would do a short presentation and also a short write-up. Um, uh, you can hand in the assignment at the end of the semester and also during the lectures maybe in the second half of the course will uh, be your presentation. Um, as I said, there's uh, lecture videos. I, I just record everything uh, by default now because I've been doing it for two years. And um, actually, it's uh, quite a good resource, I think, just to upload. And then, um, and then you can basically look at the lectures yourself later on and actually other people in the world also kind of look at the lectures too. So you can take a look at the YouTube page here. Um, okay, and it's just it's just fine print for um, so expectations. I expect people to actually turn up to the lectures, even though they're recorded. <laughs> uh, Um, students are expected to participate in class and you know discuss ideas. So please certainly 
um, you know, ask quite lots of questions. If I'm explaining something that doesn't make sense to you, then, you know, the advantage of having relatively small class like this is that you can, you can really just sort of go through topics as, as you, as you kind of like, so. Okay, and yeah, okay. Academic integrity and so forth. Okay, all right, so any questions? I think that's the last slide, yeah. Any questions? All right, so maybe, um, can I just get to know everybody here? So um, uh, could you just say your name and your major and um, anything else of interest? Oh, you're measuring yeah. physics too. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I was going to go back to the investment. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, okay, great. Yes. Um, okay, all right. So, okay, so this is um, a bit different to last year. So, last year I had uh, two math students, so they, they'd never done physics before, but this year we actually. Physics students, which is great. Um, so, how much quantum mechanics have you guys done? Not much. Yeah. Yeah, not much. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. Um, in a way, that's perfect because, um, you know, as I said, a lot of this course is just sort of learning quantum mechanics, but. Um, uh, I don't teach it in the kind of the traditional way. Like the traditional way to learn quantum mechanics is like you have a Schrodinger equation and solving differential equations as derivative, and, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and basically I just don't do that at all. Um, I completely skip over differential equations and uh, we will do it completely with a sort of matrix mechanics method is actually much better for quantum computing anyway. Um, so there's actually not, in, in the case of quantum computing, there's really not much uh, that you really miss out on by doing it this matrix way rather than the differential equation. So, um, uh, yeah, so I mean, if you um, continue on in physics, then I think this could be actually a really great way to learn it once and then, you know, when you do quantum mechanics, you'll probably relearn it the traditional way and then you'll probably, uh, well, um, you know, understand it better the second time around. Okay. Um, let me then move on to The basic introduction. That's better. That mouse is better. Okay, so um, this is uh, yes. So this is just a very. It's almost like a popular science introduction to quantum mechanics, but it just gives you a taste of um, you know, what is quantum mechanics. Perhaps you, if you're physics students, then. You might have seen a lot of this before, but well, let's go through it anyway. Okay, so so what is quantum physics? Well, uh, quantum physics is, of course, the theory of usually very small things. So things like atoms, light, 
Electron, anything small, you generally should be using quantum mechanics to describe it. So, um, as I'll sort of explain a little bit uh, in this slide set and maybe the next one, um, quantum mechanics sort of really started off with uh, people trying to understand a couple of you know, different sort of puzzles that they couldn't really understand. And um, uh, things, one of the outstanding problems in, at the beginning of the, maybe more like the end of the 19th century, so 1800s, um, is basically, you know, how does it, what's the structure of an atom and how, you know, how, how does it, how does it give it the properties that we know that it gives. So, so we know, you know, now, of course, uh, an atom is something that's composed of protons, neutrons, electrons, and, you know, this cartoon picture of, um, of a electrons orbiting some nucleus, you know, kind of looks like this. Um, uh, but actually, this kind of picture of quantum of an atom is it really uh, a really kind of classical picture. It's not really the, the correct kind of picture. Uh, what we now know is that uh, quantum physics really is essential to understanding the nature of an atom. And an atom really looks realistically something more like this, where you have electrons and these kind of fuzzy distributions and it's impossible basically to pinpoint exactly where the electron is uh, because uh, you know, the, the electrons really do not kind of do this kind of orbit like planets around, a, around the sun. Um, it's the nature of the electron is really sort of much more different and really need quantum mechanics to explain it. Okay, so um, essentially uh, what people really realized around about this time, so end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, is that you know, uh, actually uh, particles are not, um, well, objects really are not, don't have this particle nature, and they really have this kind of uh, wave nature, and Schrodinger really was the guy that kind of made this picture really um, explicit. So uh, there's a famous equation, Schrodinger's equation is named after him. And basically this gives the actual kind of laws which determine how um, particles in quantum theory kind of behave. And Essentially what this equation is, and actually we're not really going to do this equation because that's the traditional way of learning quantum mechanics, but um, essentially what this is, is it's a bit like your, you know, F equals MA, so like your Newton's laws, but for the quantum physics world. So uh, like in quantum physics, you, sorry, like in, in Newton's physics, Newtonian physics, if you have some initial condition, then, you know, solving the equations, you can sort of see how the system will evolve in time from there. So this is basically the equation, the quantum version of the equation, that you have some wave function, and that describes your state at some point in time. And then you use this equation, and then it, it evolves in time. So you can figure out, okay, if it's this wave function now, then one second later, it will be this other wave function. This is the equation that tells you what that is. So, so for example, here on the right here, um, this is solved using Schrodinger's equation. Right? So it, this is actually uh, the real part of the wave function. This is the imaginary part. And this is the absolute value squared of the wave function. And basically what this uh, thing is doing is that initially it starts off with some wave function, you put it into this, and then it evolves it in time, and you can figure out what it does later. Uh, but the, the main thing is that this is a, a kind of a wave equation. So, 
potentially you have some kind of wave and put it in that and then it tells you how the wave changes over time. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so for example, um, uh, you can do various types of simulations with this uh, kind of Schrodinger equation, which uh, I'm actually not really going to do in this course, but um, uh, actually I have a, uh, if, you, if you go to Schrodinger equation, I think it's called Schrodinger equation dot Org. Yeah. Um, I think it's dot org. Um, so we we have like a Schrodinger equation simulator. So you can play around with that if you like. Uh, let me know if the address is wrong. I'll find the right one. It's Schrodinger equation dot org or dot net. Um, okay. So uh, for example, in this example here, what you have is a wave function, and there's a kind of a wall here, right? And when the wave hits the wall, so it bounces off. Uh, this is just like what would happen with a, well, classical ball. And because the wave function is a little bit kind of like a, you know, has this shape, even does kind of wobble a little bit like this classical ball. But the most interesting thing about this is that uh, there's some probability that this wave function actually goes through the wall. So you have this famous effect of uh, quantum tunneling. And clearly this just does not happen. With classical physics, there's no chance that this ball kind of goes through the wall, but in quantum physics there is such a chance. Um, and so this gives some kind of weird kind of effects uh, that you really do not have in classical physics. Um, if you're wondering, you know, so like over here, now the thing seems to be both reflecting and going through the wall. So how could, how could it be going through the wall and reflecting at the same time? Um, so uh, what, what actually happens there is that, um, uh, what actually happens there is that if you try to figure out did it go through the wall or did it not go through the wall, then, well, in this case, about 50-50, you'll find that it's gone through the wall or it hasn't gone through the wall. You basically never find that it's gone both through the wall and reflect it. Um, so you only find it in one of those places at a time. But that's actually because when you do a measurement, you actually alter the state. So actually, before you do the measurement, it really is actually both gone through the wall and reflected. But as soon as you do a measurement, it somehow collapses to one of these two cases. So there's an interesting kind of dynamic between uh, this wave function, which apparently you can be in two places at once, and also measure. Did you find the site? No? Okay. You can play around with that if you're interested. Okay, so um, now the fact that something can be in two places at once seems like a very weird thing. 
Um, but uh, in some in some ways, it's it's not really weird at all because, for example, uh, here's a wave, right? Okay, and here's a shark actually, right? So if you say where's the shark, obviously the shark's here, right? But if you say where's the wave, well, you know, what where's the wave is sort of the wrong question, right? Because the wave is everywhere. No, wave is the the shape of the whole thing, right? So if you're talking about a wave, it's you know it's actually not that surprising. It could be in two places at once. So you know all this stuff where you say you know oh my god you know this can be here and there at the same time. You know how, how crazy is that? Well, if you view it as a wave, it's not really that crazy. Right? Um, so, uh, but what is crazy is the fact that you know particles. Well, what you thought were particles actually do have these wave properties. I mean, that's quite an unexpected thing. I mean, thinking that this tennis ball is a ball of your whole life, and then all of a sudden you're told that it's actually a kind of a wave, and so that's a kind of a shocking fact. So it really comes down to this wave property that is the strange aspect of quantum mechanics. So, um, so, okay, so particle can be two places at once, basically because it can be a wave. But uh, once it's a wave, because uh, it is a wave, it has uh, these kind of wave-like properties. So you would have learned just from, you know, regular waves, maybe even in high school, that if you've got two waves, then these can add together, and there can be constructive interference, right? And um, you can get the double double the wave, or if they're out of phase, then you can have destructive interference. So, uh, so okay, well that's normal waves, but what quantum physics basically says is that well, you know, real things like electrons and atoms and you know maybe even larger things can actually also have this interference effect. So if you have an electron, uh, you make it go through two paths, then there'll be patches where basically you'll not see the electron at all. So there'll be some regions uh, where this kind of destructive interference will happen. And basically it's impossible to find the electron there because of this interference effect. And uh, What's sort of also interesting is that the electron actually interferes with itself in this case. So this is just one electron, it goes in and it can sort of interfere with itself. So it sort of like splits into two itself and then there's an interference effect somewhere else. Uh, so the electron, you know, it's in two places at once. And then somehow these two, two waves kind of can come together and can be this cancellation effect. Um, and if you think that, you know, this is sort of a sort of hypothetical, theoretical example, um, people have done this kind of thing and uh, using devices like this, this is a, I think it's a semiconductor device, uh, and they have like an electron and then, it, you know, it does exactly the kind of thing that I said on the previous slide. Um, and what they measure here, this is like some electrodes, contacts, and it measures like the conductance through this channel. And you can see these kind of interference tips. So you, know, you can really measure these things. And, and it's not, you know, I started off by saying that quantum physics is theory of very, very small things, but uh, it's not so small. Um, you know, this is small, this is 200 nanometers. But 200 nanometers is, well, that's 0.2 microns. Okay, it's quite small. But it's not like, it's much bigger than an atom, really. So, you know, an atom is uh, like an angstrom or something. Uh, angstrom is, of course, 10 to the minus 10, right? So this is like, you know, a thousand times bigger than that. So you can see quantum physics in 
materials which are small and you know this is just one example you can even see it in much um, much bigger systems even um, and for example even uh, laser light so this, this is laser light coming out of my pointer here um, laser light is an example of uh, basically quantum physics working to produce this type of very special light so, um, in fact, laser light is, you can view laser light as a quantum wave function, uh, but consisting of photons. Um, it just so happens that all the, all the photons are all in the same, same state. This is why laser light has such special properties. Um, anyway, the point is, is that uh, quantum physics is Generally small, but sometimes not, not so small, actually. Um, and you might have heard of this thing called particle wave duality. So uh, I've been going on about how um, you know, things like electrons have this kind of wave nature. So, okay, so we, clearly quantum physics says that things have wave-like property. Um, so what's the particle wave duality? What, what does that mean? Well, it basically means that uh, as soon as you try to measure it, it kind of reverts back to being a particle. So, so when you say, you know, when, when this electron, for example, here goes through this double slit, right? Like Young's double slit experiment. It goes through the screen and then you see this interference fringes because the electron has some wave properties. But when you go and actually measure, all right, so now I want to know where's the electron? Tell me where the electron is on this screen. And you know, you might do that by putting a camera or something uh, at the back of the screen. And then if you do that, what you find is that the electron is not just sort of, you know, like spread out like a wave function or something. It's actually, it actually is a dot, right? So just like, well, you originally thought the electron is like a particle, it's like a dot somewhere, right? And, but the thing is, is that when you uh, look at lots and lots of measurements of these electrons, then uh, where the electrons start to build up actually does have this so even though each measurement is only a dot, it still apparently is following this kind of wave-like behavior. So something sort of very funny happens because over here it's behaving like a wave, it's a wave, and then you know interference and you know, destructive interference still like a wave, and then as soon as you look at it, it becomes a particle. Right? So it's kind of it's like it's switching between being a wave and switching between particle. Uh, kind of depending on whether you're looking at it or you're not looking at it. Right? So um, this is this particle wave duality that it sort of it has this wave property definitely because otherwise you wouldn't see the interference. But as soon as you look at it, it's, it looks like a particle. So it's doing both. It's just quite a strange kind of you know behavior. You would expect something to either be a wave or a particle, but and it has properties of both. Um, um, and then, you know, the, the quantum weirdness doesn't stop there because if you uh, go further, you can create other strange states where the so called entanglement. In entanglement, you uh, Again, just a different type of quantum state, but you can have uh, correlations between particles that apparently kind of extend through space so that these things can instantaneously affect each other. So, for example, uh, you might have a source of two, two photons, and if they're in this entangled state, then uh, if you 
find this photon in the up vertical polarization and this one also be vertical. This one is horizontal, this will be horizontal. But before you measure it, it's not really both. It's in this kind of entangled state, which is it's not really definitely both, but as soon as you measure one, it forces the other one to be in the same one. And before you do that, it's really not in any of these states. Uh, and then somehow there's this uh, apparent correlation which just travels through space and it happens faster than the speed of light. Um, and and it just sort of it, it just has this strange property. It seems to violate Einstein's theory of relativity, but uh, because of the random results it, it actually doesn't completely so in the end. It's a strange kind of effect. Which this this we will talk about. Um, and other things like Schrodinger's cat. This is more like taking the logical extreme of what uh, superposition is and uh, as you know this is the famous kind of thought experiment where uh, you have a box and there is an atom which in, is in some kind of state where it either decays or it doesn't decay. And so if it decays, then there's a Geiger counter which detects the decay, which triggers a hammer, which smashes a vial of poison and then it kills the cat. Or if it doesn't decay, then nothing happens, the cat is alive. And then so quantum mechanically you would have to describe this whole situation as uh, the cat as being dead and alive at the same time. And so this is obviously a kind of an experiment to sort of show that quantum mechanics is strange. And, you know, how can a cat be dead and alive at the same time? Um, and I mean another point that this kind of raised, which especially, you know, I'm sure that they didn't really understand very well, but these days they do understand a bit better. Is um, you know how how does this quantum aspect that's only seen in the microscopic world translate to the macroscopic world, right? So apparently atoms are okay; they're determined by quantum mechanics, fine. But cats apparently are not. So, but, but cats are made of atoms, right? So how can something go from being determined by quantum mechanics and then suddenly not being determined by quantum mechanics? So somewhere in the middle, something must happen so that quantum mechanics doesn't, doesn't apply. But I mean, why shouldn't it apply? Because cat is, after all, just a, a lot of atoms, right? So um, people understand this a little bit better now. So. Um, through things like uh, decoherence theory, people understand <coughs> um, why cats are not determined by quantum mechanics, but atoms are. Um, it's something we will we will talk about a little bit. In this talk. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Um, uh, uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, so, uh, the, the true answer is basically that, uh, so to some extent, I think we understand this because we understand much better how decoherence works. And basically, the, the idea of decoherence is that for very small things, um, uh, basically, um, how best to explain it? Um, um, uh, well, 
the idea of uh, decoherence is that essentially uh, quantum systems are always affected by noise. Okay. And smaller things basically are less affected by noise because they're small, actually. So because they're small, there's not much, there's less a chance of that thing to interact with things around it. And uh, the more the thing interacts with the surrounding things, the more chance that there's some kind of noise that's going to affect the state. And <laughs> essentially what de happens in decoherence is that you, you imagine something with, uh, like, say you have an atom, and then say you have some wave function. And essentially all the things that surround it are acting to kind of disturb this wave wave. And so, you know, maybe one will, like, say, flip the phase of the wave, and uh, one will maybe you know, change the uh, frequency of the wave, and things like this, right? And essentially, if you, you, if you have, you know, say this is your original wave, and then, you know, say some noise sometimes affects it to flip the phase, Sometimes the frequency will go up, and this one will go up, and maybe this one will have even higher frequency. And then if you add all these things together, and let's say sort of add everything together, then basically the original wave kind of thing that you had uh, is all kind of gets dis you know, kind of disappears because of all these different phases all canceling out and giving. Uh, destroying the wave uh, property of, of the system. Right? So uh, the larger the object is, it turns out, like, the more sensitive it is to such noise coming from outside. So it's, it's partly because the more atoms there are, the you know, more things that are going to affect it. But, but also just by being very big, the, you can show that the... Um, the wave function itself becomes actually much more sensitive. So even though, you know, even if it's the same wave function acting with the same noise, if, if it's something that's very big, even the same noise will actually destroy the big thing much more than the smaller thing. And it's just a, it's a question of kind of, um, yeah, kind of how the noise interacts with it. So, so basically, the I think the modern answer to this question is that, well, uh, the atom, yeah, will you can see the quantum properties, okay, but basically by the time you get to something really big, uh, the the you know the thing being in two things at once will be so so delicate and so sensitive to any noise that happens around it that you won't see it. Right? It's basically the, the the modern answer to to this kind of paradox. Um, maybe we'll talk about this more. I guess. Um, right, so, so quantum technology is a sort of, uh, sorry, uh, quantum physics was developed in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, so Schrodinger and Heisenberg and all these guys it's like sort of 1920s, this type of kind of. Uh, um, and of course, at the same time, you know, technology improved immensely in the 20th century. You know, 19th century, 20th century, the technology is really exploding. Uh, and of course, things like computers are, you know, I don't need to tell you how important computers are. Um, so uh, one point of view um, for why we should look into quantum computers is, well, firstly, you know, just classical computers, it's actually kind of difficult to keep on going on this Moore's law trend. Have you guys heard of Moore's law? Yeah, 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 exactly, yes. 
So Moore's law is, says a number of transistors uh, in a computer uh, doubles every 18 to 24 months. And this was basically true you know, for, for many decades, right? So this only goes back to 1970, but I think even before then it was, it was doing, kind of going at this pace. Um, but uh, basically there's a limit to how much you can speed up computers because essentially the way that it got this kind of speed up is by you know making these chips very very small and um, by squeezing many 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 transistors into the same chip you can kind of have much more powerful processes but uh, you know When is Moore's law going to end? Well, I think a lot of people says it's already ended. Um, here's just some slightly outdated quotes from famous people. So, Chief Architect of Intel was saying that in 2013 and 2020, Moore's law would be over. Um, NVIDIA CEO says Moore's law is just not possible. Um, so, Maybe this is a this is slightly uh, yeah. This this graph shows a few other types of um, scaling. So Moore's law is the most famous. So this is the number of transistors. Right? It only goes to twenty ten. But uh, there's things like clock speed. Um, so you guys would have noticed that kind of within your lifetime, somehow you know clock speeds used to just keep on going up faster and faster, right? But now they don't. Right? Everything. Is stuck at a few, few gigahertz. Uh, power, also saturated, this is some kind of ratio of performance, clock speed. Uh, so all these things are kind of saturated, and so um, uh, the reason why is, of course, you, you can't just keep on making these chips, uh, well, the, the structures on the chip smaller and smaller because essentially we're already getting to the level where uh, the structures that we're trying to make are not that much bigger than the atomic scale, right? So for example, this is, uh, you know, some of the recent, not so recent, four years ago, um, structures that they're making. So, you know, these are like some kind of three nanometer gates, but three nanometers, that's 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 only uh, you know uh, maybe about ten times bigger than an atom, right? So silicon atom diameter is 0.42 nanometers. It's only really kind of creating structures that are just like dozens of atoms thick, right? And obviously, you can't just keep on making these things small. Uh, gallium arsenide, which is another famous kind of semiconductor material is also similar, similar kind of size. Um, and uh, I think I pointed out this kind of Denard scaling, which is power density. So this is also something that's kind of saturated. Right? Uh, I pointed this out because basically, you know, the, the main problem with computers at some level is that, you know, these things generate heat and you have to get rid of the heat, but you know, once things get very small, you just, you just can't get rid of the heat, otherwise your whole chip melts. So, uh, quantum effects also cause heat. So, um, so basically, you know, this is kind of a problem in terms of classical computing, and you know, so I guess uh, computers these days have gone to sort of paralyzing more than actually making the chips smaller themselves. Um, also, you know, we can get keep on improving using that kind of approach, but uh, even that, I guess, at some point will uh, sort of saturate. So, so we can view this kind of as a problem, or we can view, view it as an opportunity. You know, if we're getting to the level where technology is being able to kind of manipulate things at the atomic scale, then we can kind of 
treat that as a kind of a problem and say, well, you know, quantum mechanics is ruining our computing computing technology, or perhaps we can actually do something completely new and maybe create a new type of computer uh, using quantum physics. So it's not a, a problem, you actually use it to your advantage. So, um, well, that's, that's just sort of the computing kind of perspective, but, uh, well, what about other types of technology? Well, um, well, recently people are really getting quite excited about quantum computing and quantum information uh, and quantum technologies because basically uh, people are kind of starting to view this as a new source of like technological progress. So if you look at all the different kind of inventions that were made in the 19th and 20th century, most things were basically all things, pretty much all things were um, based on classical physics, right? So all these kind of engineering things like telephones, cars, airplanes, these things, you know, basically classical, classical physics that is determining the operation of these things, right? Um, obviously in the 19th century, quantum theory didn't even exist, so not surprising, but even in the sort of latter part of 20th century, um, it's not like there's really a lot of inventions that really use quantum mechanics, actually. So here are some which uh, kind of use quantum physics. So for example, uh, transistors, well, it's kind of quantum in the sense that the ma semiconductor materials, to understand them, you kind of need to understand quantum theory. It's not really a quantum invention as such. It's just sort of using a material which best understood with quantum theory. Uh, similarly with uh, superconductors. So superconductors is actually uh, also a very quantum, you know, you really need quantum physics to understand that. Uh, actually, uh, superconductors are a lot like lasers. Um, the fact that you get a very special kind of light is very related to the fact that you get a very special state in a superconductor. And they're both basically quantum effects. Um, so uh, these types of inventions are kind of indirectly quantum in the sense that you using some quantum, some kind of physical effect which you wouldn't be able to understand very well without um, but uh, there are some, you know, much more generally quantum mechanical types of inventions. And I guess what I mean by that is, you know, this is really using um, quantum physics and kind of controlling the quantum physics in the way that you want the thing to be in order to <coughs> um, achieve your purpose, right? So. Um, often people that are working in my field, uh, we kind of call ourselves sort of quantum engineers. And we do that because uh, instead of just sort of taking a back seat and says, okay, do something and a quantum material and let's make something nice out of this quantum material. Yeah, the kind of thing that you sort of more do is like, you sort of say like, okay, here's my quantum you know, system. And then I'm going to use like quantum physics in my actual tool set to kind of do something with this kind of system, which is, uh, you know, that wouldn't really occur naturally, right? Kind of engineer the system like quantum mechanically to do the thing that we want to do. And uh, some of these things are, are like a little bit more like that. So, for example, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI machines, NM, or, or NMR, physics contents. Yeah. These, this is really controlling the, the states of molecules. Um, and the way that you do that, you shine 
uh, various types of radio frequencies, microwaves, onto the molecule, and then you kind of manipulate the, the state of the atom. Um, and then you, know, you, you can use that for imaging. Um, also, this squid, this is another thing that you have for lunch. Um, it's a superconducting quantum interference device. So, basically, it uses like a loop of superconductors detect magnetic fields to uh, basically the most precise measurements of magnetic fields. I mean, such devices, you would have to really make them, right? Are they lying around somewhere? So in that sense, it's really engineered. But, um, yeah, I said that already. Um, so, so basically, you know, the people that are working, researching in my particular field are kind of like looking at, you know, what's out here in terms of inventions, right? What can we invent that we couldn't invent with classical physics before? Because classical physics, well, okay, well, you know, maybe there's many more smart things you can make, but, um, but, you know, here we've got a whole new kind of playground with a whole new different set of rules that perhaps we can do things that we just couldn't even dream of doing with classical physics. Um, and this kind of Venn diagram that I've drawn here is kind of uh, realistic in the sense that um, so quantum physics is a theory that actually, uh, in some limiting case, includes classical physics. So you can actually derive classical physics from quantum physics. But the other way you can't do, you can't, you can't start with classical physics and somehow look at some limiting case and then turn it, turn it into quantum physics. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a smaller subset of kind of physical laws that you're talking about in classical physics compared to uh, quantum physics. So, uh, you know, this is why sort of quantum, you know, quantum technology is kind of exciting because you know there's not many things that have been done. You know, there's only a handful of quantum inventions like lasers, and MRI machines. Okay, those are very useful, but you know maybe there's a lot more. And so quantum computers, quantum computers, this is one of them. But, but perhaps there's many more things that you could potentially invent. Um, so, uh, the types of things that a lot of people think about are things like this. So, so I've already mentioned quantum computers, what we'll be mainly talking about in this course, but uh, quantum key distribution, this is uh, secure transmission of information. So, basically, it's cryptography. Uh, of course, this is very important in today's age. Everybody's using their computers, and sending very sensitive information, right? You've got all your banking details, basically all your money, you know, everything that's important to you, it's all on your computer, right? So it's, uh, being able to communicate without having somebody steal or manipulate this information is, of course, very important. So um, doing, people think that using quantum mechanics, you can actually do a much more better job of this. Quantum metrology, this is talking about making very precise measurements. So uh, what this picture is supposed to be is uh, it's like a gravitational wave detector, so it's some kind of satellite that's orbiting somewhere and then you measure these gravitational waves in space. Um, one way that people think you can do this more precisely even than what people do now is to uh, use quantum physics and uh, use special quantum states that are much more sensitive. Um, quantum simulators, uh, this might be the least uh, kind of easy one to understand, but actually it could even be the most important one in terms of practical applications, because um, uh, 
Uh, this is basically simulating complex materials. And by complex materials, this could be things like, well, really new materials, things to, um, fabrics or I don't know what, but you know, new conductors or things like this, but it could also be new chemicals. So, you know, what chemists do, so uh, there's several chemistry faculty here, um, but basically what all of them are doing is so-called quantum chemistry. And this is trying to understand chemistry taking into account of quantum mechanics. And this is a really hard problem, and what people do is to use like very, you know, large-scale computing machines, high-performance computers, and you know they write some code to simulate it. And even with these very powerful computers, you have to make lots of approximations, and then finally you can sort of you know, do a reasonable job at getting a good model for these chemicals. Um, but perhaps with quantum computers and this quantum technology, uh, you might be able to simulate these things much more precisely without any approximation. Basically, because this is a quantum system already, right? So the difficult thing is uh, simulating the quantum physics on a classical computer. You know, if you use a quantum computer to simulate quantum physics might be much easier. And in fact, people have shown that it is. Um, and actually, you know, this is a, a, a big industry actually, right? So it's, it's not like that, you know, it doesn't sound like the coolest thing, but in terms of like economy, like if you just look at say pharmaceutical industries, to develop like one drug, companies spend typically like $1 billion to make one drug, right? And so hard because it's so hard to understand these chemicals. And they, you know, they start off with like a thousand chemicals or maybe more, a million chemicals, and then they find one drug which actually does the job you want, right? And, you know, it's a very, very expensive process. Perhaps this could uh, help to make that process much more efficient. Um, yeah, so uh, this one is talking a bit about the um, sort of this quantum key distribution. So this is uh, one way we're trying to communicate securely with each other. And um, actually, this was perhaps the technologically the, the simplest one out of these four, four ones. So this is why uh, already like 10 or maybe 20 years ago, uh, several commercial companies setting up systems, selling systems to perform this kind of quantum communication securely. So there's commercial companies like ID um, and several places in the world have these kind of quantum networks. Um, so, of course, in the US, Europe, and maybe most recently in China, um, quantum networks securely transmitting information using these types of systems. Um, and yeah, so you guys probably be familiar with uh, the developments here where there's a quantum satellite that was launched um, and um, the, the satellite had this uh, ability to uh, distribute photons and perform some of these uh, quantum cryptographic uh, protocols. You guys, you guys know about this? <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, this is really quite a, it was quite a, a big deal, actually, this, this experiment. Um, so, um, sort of an interesting story, uh, but, uh, yeah, so, when people,
people were trying to do these types of um, quantum communication experiments, uh, one of the big problems is that you couldn't communicate longer than maybe 100 or 200 kilometers because uh, if you use optical fibers, the photons would just be absorbed in the fiber. Or you can also do it in free space like this. This is an experiment that was done around about here. Uh, and they did it over 140 kilometers. But that was about the maximum that you could do. But, um, and so people were talking about going to space. And if you go to space, obviously there's, uh, well, obvious. In hindsight, it's obvious. People didn't know until you really did it. But uh, many people thought that going to space, you could communicate much better because, well, there's, you know, space is a vacuum, right? Nothing, nothing's going to interfere with the photons. Um, and so Europe and America, they were talking about this for many decades, actually. They were probably talking about it for 20 years. But, but nobody really did it until um, so China, the USTC, the University of Science and Technology China group, uh, Han Jianwei. Yeah. So he launched the, uh, this kind of experiment, launched the satellite demonstrated this. Um, th this was a real, real big breakthrough, actually. So this was very exciting stuff to see when it was first coming out. So uh, in this field, actually, maybe China is the, is, no, not maybe, I think China is definitely the world leader in this, this particular area. Uh, for quantum computing, I think uh, some other countries are still maybe a bit ahead, but um, but actually, you know, now China has a very, very strong quantum uh, physics program. And it's, uh, you know, I only arrived in China in 2015, but uh, during this time, it's just changed so much. And, um, yeah, so uh, a lot of different exciting developments. Okay, um, maybe maybe I'll just leave it there, and we'll. Anyway, I'm pretty much nearly finished this slide set, but uh, that's fine today. Okay, any questions? Okay. All right. And see you Thursday.